Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And today we're gonna to be looking at Napoleon Smashes Prussia, Jena, 1806. Welcome to the third part of the Napoleon series because why not? Everything's gotta be a series. Let's make it a Napoleon series. And last time we left off, it was in 1805 at Austerlitz, which is arguably Napoleon's first true masterpiece. Now, what was the conclusion of that? Austria has gone to peace immediately with France after a completely embarrassing defeat. Um, France gains lands in Italy, and more importantly, they gain lands in Germany, which leads to the Confederation of the Rhine, ultimately making the Holy Roman Empire useless as Francis, um, who is the king of the Holy Roman Empire, he abdicates his throne a few years later, or actually maybe it was in 1806. But anyways, it was very shortly after the Confederation of the Rhine was created. And yeah, Austria is in ruins. They've peaced out. And though you would think that this would create an af after, eh, everlasting peace in Europe, Prussia is now going to be the one to start the war of the Fourth Coalition. The Fourth Coalition against Napoleon. All the other ones has been a resounding victory for him. So without further ado, if you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let's get into it. TV History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. In December 1805, at the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, won a crushing victory against the joint forces of Austria and Russia. Napoleon now dominated Europe. Ah oh yeah, and a point to note too is that Russian troops were allowed to pass freely back to Russia after this, so they weren't chased down all the way back to Russia. They were allowed to pass freely, which was one of the conditions of this treaty able to hand out spoils as he saw fit. In February 1806, he sent an army led by Marshal Massena to overthrow the King of Naples, who had dared to side with his enemies, and gave his throne to his own brother Joseph instead. There you go. Another brother, Louis, was made King of Holland. His German allies, Bavaria and Württemberg, were elevated to the status of kingdoms while Napoleon made himself protector of the Confederation of the Rhine, yep. a new alliance of German states that would contribute 60,000 troops to his army. In a recognition of the new reality, Emperor Francis of Austria formally dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, founded by Charlemagne a thousand years before, but now without influence or purpose. And so I did a video on Charlemagne, actually. And just to think about that, one, not one man, because that's not really how things work. And we do sort of have a great leader fallacy in our, in our culture. But the effects of the decisions that Napoleon and his team made dissolved an empire that had existed for a thousand years in Europe. Crazy. Austria had been humiliated. France remained at war with Britain, Sweden, and Russia. But in the summer of 1806, all eyes were on Prussia. Yep. <laughs> the Prussian king, Frederick William III, regarded Napoleon with deep mistrust and had been about to join the coalition against him when news arrived of its disastrous defeat at Austerlitz. He was heavily influenced by his wife, the celebrated and popular Queen Louise, who detested France and Napoleon. She led the influential war party at the Prussian court. Matters came to... At least their name was, you know, they got right up there. And this, this rivalry between Germany and France would definitely have no consequences moving forward from here ever again. Right? Right? ...ahead over Hanover, a German state which had belonged to British King George III, been occupied by the French, and given by Napoleon to Prussia as compensation for other territorial changes. Now the Prussians learned that Napoleon had secretly offered to give Hanover back to Britain in exchange for peace. Mm, Frederick's advisers now persuaded him that war was the only honourable course. But Prussia then made a basic strategic blunder, sending an ultimatum to Napoleon without <laughs> consulting its new allies in the Fourth Coalition. Ah, uh, nice. Their forces were too far away to help Prussia. 
who would now face Napoleon's Grande Armée, uh -oh. with just the small state of Saxony for support. Oh. Okay. I can see why this episode is titled Napoleon Smashes Prussia. Right, that's it, right? Yeah, Napoleon Smashes Prussia. In 1806, Prussia. the Prussian oh, army go had a fearsome reputation that dated back 50 years to the reign of Frederick the Great. Napoleon, a student of history, regarded it with respect. But Prussia's army had been allowed to rest on its laurels. Mm. Its generals were old. Its staff work hindered by bureaucracy and personal rivalries. Its movements ponderous and predictable. Prussian soldiers, however, could be relied on to fight with pride and determination, while Prussian cavalry was regarded as amongst the best in Europe. In October 1806, Napoleon invaded Saxony with an army of 166,000 men and 256 guns. Wow. Advancing in three columns, the French crossed the mountain forests of the Thuringerwald, along roads carefully reconnoitred by scouts and spies. Napoleon intended to threaten Leipzig and force a decisive battle with the Prussian army, which he believed was near Gera. The Prussians were, in fact, further west, concentrating near Erfurt, on the west bank of the river Saale. All right. Its commander, the Duke of Brunswick, had hoped to threaten the flank of Napoleon's advance. But wrong-footed by the speed of the French, he now ordered a retreat north to find a new defensive line. On the 10th of October, at Saalfeld, Marshal Lannes' Five Corps clashed with a Prussian advance guard commanded by Prince Louis Frederick, the King's cousin. Okay. The Prussian good force so was routed, and Prince Louis himself killed in combat with a quartermaster of the French 10th Hussars. You know, they just, they just took out a prince. No big deal, this is, this is off to a Three days start. later, Never mind, Lannes I take my words made back. contact with a large Prussian force near Jena and sent news to Napoleon. The French Emperor, believing he'd found the main Prussian army, rapidly issued orders for his corps to concentrate for battle at Jena. Bernadotte's one corps and Davout's three corps were to cross the Sala and fall on the Prussian flank from the north. But Napoleon was wrong. Lan faced a 35,000-strong Prussian rearguard, commanded by General Hohenlohe. The main okay. Prussian army, 52,000 men under the Duke of Brunswick, was further north, moving straight into the path of Davout's three corps. Okay. I have to make an observation here. So even though I'm already, well, let's see, watch four videos on Epic History TV about Napoleon, there's always this moment it's, it's like a five-act structure in a movie where the characters are at their lowest and you think, oh, how's he going to get out of this one? And yet every single time he manages to. And that point right there where it's like, uh-oh, what's Napoleon going to do? And yet he's going to come out and he's going to completely crush his enemies. So <laughs> just a little like running theme that I noticed here. I love these videos. These videos are so amazing. The Battle of Jena began at 6.30 a.m. on the 14th of October, in thick fog. Marshal Land's Five Corps already had a toehold on the plateau west of the town and river. His first task was to drive back the Prussians, and win room for the rest of the French army, arriving by the hour, to deploy. His infantry led the way and fierce fighting broke out for the villages of Kospeda, Klosowitz, and Lutzeroda. Meanwhile, Augereau's 7 Corps advanced through a ravine, emerging onto the plateau on Land's left flank, okay. while Sult's 4 Corps climbed steep tracks to form on his right. Napoleon joined Lan in the centre of the battlefield, organising a 25-gun battery to support the attack on Wurzenheiligen. Of course he did. 
The village was won, but then lost to a determined Prussian counterattack. On the right, around 10 a.m., Soult's infantry secured Klosowitz, but was counterattacked on its right flank near Rudigen. A decisive charge by Soult's light cavalry drove off the Prussians, routing their infantry and capturing two enemy colours. As VI Corps began to arrive on the plateau, its fearless but impetuous commander, Marshal Ney, ignored orders ah, yes. and dived into the fighting around Wurzenheiligen, becoming briefly cut off by a Prussian counterattack and having to be rescued by guard cavalry. General Hohenlohe was expecting the arrival of 15,000 more troops under General Ruschel at any moment. Until then, he remained largely inactive, shoring up his line and ordering limited counterattacks. Hmm. But he had run out of time. Napoleon had begun the day with just 25,000 men. By 12.30, and a steady course, stream of reinforcements he's outnumbered. had brought his strength up to 96,000. As the Emperor rode past the Imperial Guard, one young soldier, eager to be sent into action, called out, Forward! Napoleon stopped and demanded to know who had spoken, then rebuked the soldier as a beardless youth who ought not to offer advice until he too had commanded in 30 battles. Ooh. Oof. But the moment had sick burn, bro. <laughs> arrived. Although a beardless the youths, we should really bring that back, you know, calling people beardless youths. Its frustration remained in reserve. The other French corps were ordered forward in a general attack. Wow. The Prussian army began to give ground. This. At first, it kept its discipline, but then disintegrated into a general rout. Just organized Uras chaos. cavalry of it all. were launched in pursuit riding down and sabering hundreds of fleeing Prussians. Oh. General Ruchel's two divisions finally arrived, at the worst possible moment. No, right in the chaos they of it all. held up five corps' advance, oh. but were soon outflanked, broken up by cannon fire, and charged down by French cuirassiers. Look at this. Oh, man. <sighs> Meanwhile, 12 miles to the north, near Auerstadt, Marshal Davout was marching southwest, expecting to fall on the Prussian left wing at Jena. Instead, he encountered ah, the Duke Blücher. of Brunswick's main Prussian army. Mm. Head he'll, he'll be a reoccurring character if I remember correctly. Blücher also showed up later. Heading north to take up new positions. Davout's three corps, 27,000 men and 48 guns, was about to face odds of two to one. While Bernadotte's one corps, which had orders to support Davu, was nowhere to be seen. Mm. Davu, nicknamed the Iron Marshal, showed no signs of alarm. He formed his first division into a defensive line centered on the village of Hassenhausen, his infantry forming squares to repel a series of cavalry charges by General Blücher's advance guard. Okay, I have to ask one question though. So when they're fighting in a village like this, right, when you can see, obviously the infantry position is here, and though these are massive columns, these are cl columns that are kilometers long, right? Or at least, you know, yeah, probably at least one kilometer long. But then do they actually use any of the ur urban, quasi, I know it's a village, but do they actually use any of this infrastructure as well when they're fighting? Or do they just go out into open plains, right? Or relatively open plains. I understand there's some forest here, but that's kind of my question is that do they use these infrastructure that really exists in these villages? Or do they just try and bring it to an open battlefield because maybe it's easier to coordinate? I don't know. If, if you know, let me know in the comment section below. His other two infantry divisions arrived to strengthen the line, standing firm in the face of repeated Prussian attacks. But Prussian movements were slow and poorly coordinated. 
nor did they use their numerical advantage to try and outflank Davout. Mm. At a crucial moment, the Duke of Brunswick was shot through the eyes, a wound that proved fatal. King Frederick William himself took command. Mm. Several Prussian units remained uncommitted, but the king, convinced he faced the main French army under Napoleon, dithered. Oh. Around 1215, Marshal Davout counterattacked. The Prussian army turned and fled. No. No, what? No way, they just fled? They thought that that was the main army. Wow. All it takes for the Prussian army to surrender is the sight of a Frenchman, eh? Wow. Oh my god. Davout wow. had won a stunning victory of against course. the odds. But at a heavy <sighs> price. His corps suffered 25% casualties, mm. one man in four killed or wounded, Ouch. while inflicting twice as many losses on the Prussians. Outnumbered. Fancy. When news reached Napoleon that Marshal Davout had engaged and defeated the main Prussian army, he reacted first with disbelief, yeah. then heaped praise upon the Iron Marshal, later awarding him the title Duke of Auerstadt. Marshal Fair Bernadotte, enough. in contrast, was nearly court-martialed for failing to support Davout. Napoleon's army began a masterful pursuit of the beaten Prussians, giving them no time to regather their strength. Two weeks after the twin battles of Jena Auerstadt, Napoleon's troops, led by Davout's yep. heroic Three Corps, entered Berlin. The next day. And if I remember correctly, too, so this is Brandenburg Tor, so the Brandenburg Gate. And if I remember correctly, <laughs> um, Napoleon actually took the, the statue here on the top and brought it back to France. And then the, the Prussians during the Franco Prussian War did bring it back to Berlin. I might be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that is what happened. I do know that Napoleon does have some influence on the top of this statue here at the Brandenburger Gate, and I think that's correct. Let me know if I'm wrong down below. General Hohenlohe surrendered at Prenzlau. At Lübeck, General Blücher mm, and 20,000 Prussians were driven out of the city in heavy fighting and forced to surrender. Cool. While 25,000 huh. Prussians besieged at Magdeburg, surrendered to Marshal Ney. Prussia's army had been devastated by a Napoleonic blitzkrieg. Wow. In just 33 <laughs> days, Prussia had lost 20,000 dead. And, and Germany will never know what a blitzkrieg is like ever again. They'll, they'll never... That will have no effect on history whatsoever. <laughs> 140,000 prisoners. 800 guns, and 250 standards. It was a humiliation that proud wow. Prussians like General Blücher would neither forget yep. nor forgive. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he'll be a reoccurring character. Unlike Saxony, King Frederick William refused to make peace with Napoleon. He continued to hold out in East Prussia, trusting in the approaching Russian armies to rescue his kingdom. Despite another glorious victory for Napoleon and the Grande Armée, the war was not won yet. Still, wow. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military commanders of all time. And possibly one of the most competent men to ever live. I remember reading that somewhere online. And pff, wow, what a complete devastation of Prussia. Just, can you imagine that too? Like, I mean, look at this. Right, so he, he he has a massively important battle outside of Leipzig, and then just chases them off, captures one of their, although not their capital, one of their cultural hotspots, and one of their most important cities in Berlin, and then goes and encircle, basically decimates some of his troops out there in the north, forces his other generals to surrender, like, this has got to be the peak, right? Right? Like, 1806? Does it get even better for 1807? We'll find out in the next one. Thank you very much for joining me. 
All the best. Take care. I hope you're enjoying this Napoleon series. I will be doing every single video in the playlist. Thank you very much for providing that one. You know who you are. All the best. Take care. And yeah, till the next one. Cheers.